Good morning, Springs Church. Pastor Jonathan, one of your pastors, we met a few minutes ago. I'm back. Something super encouraging I want to share with you from the Lord this morning and just kind of give you a little context to where this all came from. And uh, My wife and my family and I have been on a journey for a little over a year now. Uh, many of you have trafficked with us through that, and some of you may not be aware. I'll just give you a quick uh, snapshot of what that was. Last May, our fifth child, Alina Grace, was born, and she was born with a great difficulty, uh, heart defect, and uh, she fought for about six months, went home to be with the Lord in November, and um, it's been quite the journey for us, and over the past year, I've shared uh, from my heart what God is more on the front end of why I was right in the middle of the hardest part of it, sharing with you guys of what God was speaking to my heart, and so I want to kind of give you the other side of that today, and, and uh, the media team in the next couple of weeks will be available on the website have taken the three messages that, that relate to suffering and entitled the series Grace and Suffering, and I encourage you, if you know someone who's going through difficulty, this would be a great uh, place to send them just to find some encouragement in the word, and today, even if you're not going through something as difficult as what I mentioned, I believe that God has something for all of us this morning that I want to share with you, and we're going to jump right into this. Um, because God's going to do some cool things when we get to the end of this today. So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you don't have your, your Bible with you, the, the, the verses will be behind me on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My mother is watching and she told me I needed to slow down. I speak too fast. So I'm going to try, Mom, to speak slower for you. <laughs> So, 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 1. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, where the, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but of my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I'd be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the, the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong." I want to speak to you this morning. Is his grace sufficient? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you we come before the most amazing God. That there is nothing, there is no one that can compare to who you are. I thank you for that today. I thank you that, that I stand before an almighty living God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who forever loves us, who is forever good, that there's no one who will ever bring an accusation that will be proven that you are not good. You are a good God. And we stand today, and I ask God, as I, I share these few words that you've given me, the, the things that you've, you've done in my heart over this past year, God, it would encourage, it would minister, it would build up this body, Father. You know where every heart is at today. You know what they need to hear, Father. More than just a sermon, God, we need to hear Jesus. In an hour and a day and an age we live that is so difficult to, to, to be a believer and, and, and to fully understand all of what you're doing, God, we pray today you speak to our hearts, Father. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Is his grace sufficient? Today I want to look at these passages and speak to the question of my message. Is his grace su su sufficient? Especially in times of hardship and suffering. I believe that what Paul shares in these short few verses of the first part of this chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, the answer is yes. His grace is sufficient. That it's more than enough to face difficulty that life throws at us. As a way of introduction, I want to do a couple things. First, let me define the word sufficient. As many of you may know, the New Testament was written in a Greek language, and so the word sufficient translates to mean this, to be possessed with unfailing strength. To be possessed 
with unfailing strength. God's grace is so sufficient that it's filled with unfailing strength. Think about it. That's good news. That's really good news, especially when you and I can fail of strength so easily. Thank God that his grace is unfailing strength. Second, let's just, uh, let's just uh, do a quick glance at the context of the 12 verses I read. The first four verses appear to be speaking about someone Paul knows who'd received a supernatural encounter from God. One Paul said is worth boasting about, which then leads Paul to speak about how he could boast about himself. And then in verses five and six, Paul says he, he's going to hold back so that no one thinks more of him than he should. Then we get kind of to the meat of the story today where you and I will find unfailing strength in God's grace, verses seven through 10. So now that we understand that sufficient means unfailing strength and we have an understanding of kind of what, what was happening in these first few verses, let's dive in by asking this question. How does God respond to our weakness and our pain? Well, I think the short answer is he responds with grace. Now, so many of us who have been in this house over any length of time, six months or more, you know that we speak very often of grace. Most of the time in context to our sin and our sanctification, our justification. But today, I want to talk to you about another side of grace that primarily deals with how God responds to weakness and pain. Let's first look at our story that, that I just read from, and then we're going to look at a couple more places that the scripture bears this out. 1 Corinthians 12, I want to read again verses 7 through 9. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Notice what happens to Paul. Instead of God speaking up and saying, yes, Paul, I'm gonna take this pain away from you. I'm gonna remove this difficulty out of your life. I'm gonna get rid of it for you. God simply responds with my grace. My grace. We'll come back to this part in a second, but look, look at a couple more responses in Scripture. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14, another story of difficulty, one that I, I've shared with you guys before, but it's worth repeating. Matthew 14, starting in verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, Beaten by the waves, so the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Here's this amazing picture of no one else in history next to Jesus walking on the water. Here's Peter. Stepping out in faith at the Lord's command and then begins to see the difficulty around him. Begins to realize what he has stepped into. Begins to realize what he's walking through, the waves and the wind. And all this fear begins to consume him and, and the storm becomes overwhelming. He begins to cry out to, to the Lord in fear. And the first thing that Jesus offers him is his hand. It's a picture again of my grace. Immediately it says he reached out his hand. No hesitation. His first response to Peter's calamity was... His grace. Right after that, he deals with his faith, but not simply to rebuke him, which we'll see kind of bear it out in a little bit at the end of this message. One more story, same book of the Bible, Matthew. We're going to turn over to chapter 26. <clears throat> this is uh, taking place in the last few hours of Christ's life. And this is what happens in, in Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to, to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same words again. This is Jesus himself. Let me, let me say it this way. Nothing you and I experience in this life will happen outside of first seeing it in Jesus. No passage or story of the Bible will, will, stand, on it own, will stand on its own. Everything we experience, everything we read, everything we study as believers will always first be seen in and through Jesus and what he's done for us. We call that the gospel. And what makes the gospel good news is not simply that he saved us, but he is our filter for all of life. I want you just for a moment, look at the comparison between Paul's experience and Jesus. And you'll have to turn there. The verses will, will come back up. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, three times Paul asked for his thorn to be taken away. In Matthew 26, verse 39, verse 42, verse 44, three times Jesus prayed for his thorn in effect to be taken away as he would receive a crown of thorns in moments later. What was, what was the father's own response to his son? Again, he doesn't say, yes, Jesus, I'll get you out of this pain. I'll, I'll take it away. But instead, he responds with my grace. Same story, just a different gospel. And we'll just flip over to Luke chapter 22. I want you to see God's response to Jesus. Verse 39 of, of Luke 22. And he came out and he went, as it was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. What did the angel do? Strengthening him. What was, un, what was sufficient grace? Unfailing strength. Unfailing strength. Strength. Even God did not spare his own son from weakness and pain, but for yours and my encouragement, responded to him with grace. Which leads to the second part I want to share with you this morning. What do you and I do with God's response of grace? Back in 2 Corinthians, I'm going to read verse 9 and 10 again to you. It says this. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong. After reading just those two verses again, I believe that there are three responses that we should have to God's gift of grace to us. And the first one is, to acknowledge our weakness. In fact, in, in verse nine, Paul says that you and I can boast in our weakness. He's given us permission to be transparent. In a day and age where we're supposed to be fake and we're supposed to put on the facade and we're supposed to pretend Jesus, through the words of Paul, is saying, you and I can be transparent. You and I can stand boldly and say, I'm weak. I don't have it together. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. I don't like this. Not just complaining, not just being a baby. It's being able to stand up here and say, it's okay that, that even though I've, I've gone through this difficulty, I don't have to try to pretend that it doesn't hurt. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. I found this in my studies. It says, this understanding of acknowledging our weakness gives us a radical shift in thinking, one that is deeply liberating. Because if weakness is something we can boast in, then nothing can ultimately overwhelm us. If weakness is something that you and I can boast in, then nothing can ultimately overwhelm us. The same guy, Peter, who, who in, the, in, in the storm was, was terrified and thought, I'm not going to make it. Jesus, help me. Later on, he, he responds similar to this. After getting an understanding that, that he can boast in his weakness, he says this to us in 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
We don't have to be surprised or overwhelmed by difficulty. We've been given the freedom to be weak. That's good news. That's good news all over this room. No one has to have it together. All over this room, no one has to try to pretend. No one has to try to put on a facade. We all have permission to be weak. Amen. That's right. Our second response to God's grace is we can now walk in his power. Verse nine, my power is made perfect in weakness. Perfect meaning complete. His power does not seem to show up in completeness until you and I reach a place of total weakness. His power does not seem to show up in completeness until you and I reach a place of total weakness. And that power is not simply just some supernatural surge of something. That power is unwavering faith in who Jesus is. Too often, as I've grown up in the, in the Pentecostal background, that when we begin to speak about the power of God and the supernatural power of who God is, we have a tendency to attribute it to what he does. But what he's trying to show us here is this power of faith that rests upon us is not in what he does, but in who he is. We see this, this bared out in, in Romans 4. Paul references an Old Testament story of Abraham and Sarah having a son in old age. Paul shows us that Abraham's awareness of his physical weakness made room for him to thrust all of his faith into who God was, causing God's power to do the impossible, to rest on him. Romans 4, 18 and 21, I'm going to read this to you. In hope, Abraham, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. And he had been told so that your offspring would be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. When you and I acknowledge our weakness, the Lord is ready and willing to bring us to a place of faith in his power. Our third response to his grace is now we can put Jesus on display. Now we can put Jesus on display. How do I put Jesus on display? In, in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says this, for the sake of Christ, it's speaking to, because I want Jesus to be seen, then I am content with weakness. What, what, what these next few words say are totally oxymoron to the culture that you and I are living in right now. No one ever says that these are good things to be content about. To be content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. It's counterculture for you and I to be content with those things. To be okay with those things. But because of this, because, because I understand my weakness, because I understand his power, it becomes easy for me to be content with weakness. Now, instead of others looking at me and saying, look at how strong you are. and Look at how your family has made it through this trial and this difficulty. Instead, you and I are able with bold confidence to say, no, what you see is Jesus in my pain. What you see is a testimony of what he has done, of what, who he is, not what I have done. He's holding me. He's got me. Earlier at the end of spring this year, I went for a walk in, in the neighborhood that I live in, and I had a, I had a little bit of a, a problem with the Lord. I've had a few of those moments in the last year of difficulty to express how I really feel about things with him. And so I had decided this was a, a, a me day, and I have to have those because I have four very wild and excited children, and I do not have the mother gene. I'm the father, and I have to have a break. And so I take me days so that I can keep my sanity and my wife would still love me. And so I was taking a me day and you know I'm telling the truth, any of you that have children and are your fathers. And in this me day, I decided that me and God need to have a talk. And as I began to walk and I, at first I, I did the right thing, I'm acknowledging his greatness and his goodness and God, you're so amazing and you're so powerful and a, a little bit of rhetoric, I think, coming from my mouth because my heart was ready to, to pounce with the questions. Since you're so powerful, why didn't you fix it? Why didn't you change it? Why didn't you do something different than what you did? I know of your greatness. I know of your goodness. 
Why didn't you respond in that way in this moment for me? I've served you. I love you. My life's given to you. Why didn't you do this? Fully expecting that he was going to speak back. Fully expecting that he was going to answer my questions as I deserve to hear from him. And in the gentleness of our great God, he just whispered to my heart, I'm holding you. I'm holding you. He didn't give me answers. <laughs> he didn't even go there. He just says, my grace, I'm holding you. I've got you. I've got you. And see, the good news is, is when he's holding me, what you get to see is not me anymore. You get to see him. Because I don't have to pretend. I don't have to fake it until I make it. I just let him hold me. I just let him hold me. And, 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 and if that wasn't enough of his goodness, the same day, the very same day, just moments later as I'm celebrating my me day, my wife texts me and says, we're pregnant. And yeah. Not only did he say he's holding me, but he extended hope to me as well. Four and a half months today, and tomorrow I get to find out if it's a boy or girl, and you can check social media because I'll be very proudly posting, and you'll get to know as well. But when you put Jesus on display, when you, when you allow him to be seen, he's got us. I don't have to do anything. I, I don't have to try to maintain a good face for you. When we live in a culture that, that wants us to, to muster up strength or to muster up a, a stiff upper lip, but when I understand his grace, I don't have to fake it. I just throw up my hands and surrender. See, coming into worship and lifting up my hands and my heart may be heavy and the pain may be real, but I'm not faking it. I'm just surrendering to his grace. I'm just surrendering to his arms to hold me. And you're invited to do the same thing. So the conclusion, worship team, I want you to get ready. How do we get there? If I know that God's response to my pain and my difficulty is grace, if I know that my response to God's grace is acknowledging my weakness, is walking in his power, is putting Jesus on display, how do I do that? How do I acknowledge my weakness? How do I walk in this power? How do I get to this place where his life is on display? It's simple. It's one word. Rest. Rest. 2 Corinthians 9, the last half says, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want to look at one more story as the worship team is getting ready. Mark chapter 4, another difficulty happening. Verse 35, it says this, on the day, that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with, took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you see what he's trying to communicate to his disciples? It's what he's already done. Jesus was asleep on a pillow in the boat. He was at rest in a time of great difficulty. After he dealt with the storm, after he brought the peace to the storm, he took on their faith. Why? To rebuke them? No. He was trying to show them who he was. And again, what he's already done. So often our faith it's just like the disciples in the boat. If you don't fix this, we're going to die. If you don't change my circumstance, I don't know if I'm going to make it, Jesus. What he was doing with the disciples in the boat is what he's trying to do with you and I today. To show us what he's already done for us. Rest, rest, rest. But you ask, how, how did he already provide it for them in the boat, in, in the story of the boat? He hadn't gone to the cross yet. Hebrews chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, Hebrews 4 compares the failure of the children of Israel to current believers today and challenges you and I not to the fall into the same trap of unbelief and who he is and what he's done. Let me read this to you. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. 
For we who have believed entered that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Notice the last two verses, second half of the third verse. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, he rested. It's an eternal rest that doesn't end. Verse 4, it points us to the creation story. You can read the whole thing yourself in Genesis chapter 1, verses 5 to chapter 2, verses 5. Each day he created had a beginning and it had an end. It had an evening and it had a morning, but not when he got to the seventh day. Genesis verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 31, listen to this. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The day of rest had no end and has no end. It is an eternal rest offered to you and I. It's a picture of this rest that he's already provided. One that was already available to the disciples in the boat. Him sleeping on the pillow in the storm was a picture for them and for us to see that whenever we face hardship and pain, he has rest for us. I said all that to say this. How do we get there? How do we acknowledge our weakness? How do we walk in power? How do we get to the place where he's on display? I receive the rest. I receive the rest. How do I receive it? Same chapter in Hebrews. A few verses down. I love this. Verse 14 of chapter 4. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. It's grace, grace, grace. Grace. All I have to do is come and receive it. He says, come boldly before the throne of our gracious God, the one who understands all of our weaknesses, that at every point of his life was touched by the same things that you and I are touched with. He understood it all. And all I have to do is come. And the reason that I can come boldly is because I don't have to pretend. I don't have to put on anything first. I don't have to dress up a certain way. I can just walk into his presence with all of my hang up, with all of my pain, with all of my hurt, all of my transparency and say, God, help me. And his grace comes and his mercy comes and he meets us. All I have to do is receive it. I'm going to ask that you stand with me this morning. In just a moment, the worship team is going to sing There is No One Else Like Jesus that we sang earlier. And there are three groups of people I want to invite you as they begin to sing to join me down here at the front. We're going to pray together and we're going to, we're going to spend some time in his presence. I want to invite those who, like Paul, who've been asking God, take this thorn, take this pain from me, remove this thing out of my life. And you felt like that God's kept his answers at bay. He hasn't responded Today, will you come and receive his rest and let him give you his grace? Secondly, those who would say, I feel helpless. I don't know where to turn. My circumstances have overwhelmed me. I don't know what to do. Will you come and find grace to help you when you need it most? And I referenced in the beginning that the grace isn't just for pain, but it's also for sin. That today, if you're in the house and you're living in sin, you're trapped by an addiction or trapped by destructive behaviors and you want to be free, you too can come find grace to be set free this morning. As they begin to sing this morning, I want to encourage you. We're going to turn the front of the stage. It's been called an altar. It's the front of the stage. There's nothing mystical or supernatural about it, but we're going to call it the throne of grace this morning. That's what we're going to call it. And you've been invited to come boldly to the throne of grace, to throw up your hands and surrender and say, God, hold me. God, give me your grace. I can't, I can't do it. I need you. As they begin to sing, I invite you to come and then we're going to pray together.
a little different for some of us, but we're just going to rest. We're just going to soak in his presence for a few minutes. So I got done a little early so that we'd have time to do this. No one has to feel rushed out. And just, just let him hold you. Let him minister to you right now. Let his grace just pour over you. And don't be in a hurry. There are times for prayer and there's times to speak out. But this is just a moment just to rest. Let him demonstrate to you what the throne of grace is today. Let you find that mercy and that help today, right now. Let's just, let's just stay in this attitude. They're just going to play instrumentally for a few minutes. And we're just going to hold steady as we soak in his presence. to breathe you see you take a deep breath and just slow down there's nothing weird or mystical about what we're doing I love to describe it to the children this way that the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the comforter and the presence of God brings comfort and I I usually I get this big comforter blanket that I bring in to teach them and my house to keep the temperature at night at 67 degrees the air runs out like a cold because I like to be able to take that comforter and pull it up close and snuggle and be warm to it. And that's what the presence of God is like. I know that's a little childlike picture, but he just wants to wrap himself around you, just comfort you. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing weird about that. I know we don't always have a lot of time here to do that, but we're taking a moment to do it today. He just wants to refresh you with his presence, remind you that you're his child. His grace is sufficient. He's possessing you now with unfailing strength unfailing strength just just rest in it It, lunch will still be there family will still be there just we're still early it's not even it's not even a normal time of leaving yet no rush just rest just rest
encourage you this week in, in your own personal prayer time, those of you that are down here specifically, that you would take some more time to do exactly what we're doing right now. There is a time to pray and there are needs that we need to lift up to the Lord, but he already knows what's in your heart. And I wanna just in, invite you this week to take a few few moments of your day, whether it's the start or the end of your day, whatever's more convenient for you, and just get alone with him and just soak in his presence. If it helps, put on a worship CD. Um, if it helps, you can go to the website and, and find this worship set. It'll be on, on there, and you can just hear them playing and, and just let God pour his grace over you. This is, a, this is a season, a moment for you. It's not always like this, but this is a moment he wants to give to you. He wants to fill you with unfailing strength so that you can walk through your difficulty, you can walk through your circumstance with his help. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you are here today. I thank you that you made the access to your throne of grace so easy for us and that today we're able to stand here and kneel and rest in your presence, God, that this is just a foretaste God, today was meant to stir our hearts towards you, but God, usually you, you, allow, you allow us to come to the end of ourselves, and we're facing difficulty and circumstances. You'll let us work really hard. You'll let us try really hard to get through it until we can come to this place of surrender. And then you just meet us. Then you just, you just pour your grace upon us. And I pray, God, as an encouragement this week, God, that you would challenge the hearts of those that responded to get alone with you and to spend time in your presence and just let you pour yourself over them. God, you just communicate your grace to them. There doesn't have to be a whole lot of words in their change. Just, just an intimate time with you, God. You're calling us to a place of intimacy. You're going to meet us in the secret place. I pray, God, that you would encourage our hearts to respond to that this week. And we thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name.